Welcome back for another episode of uh, Nerd Talk. We have been away for a while. Uh, we've been moving. Uh, so today we are uh, uh, broadcasting this from Freedom Lab in Amsterdam and no longer from De Waag. Um, but we are back with a very interesting guest. Welcome. Who are you and what do you do? Hi, thanks uh, for having me here. My name is Philip. Um, I'm running TestBirds, uh, a crowdsourced uh, testing company. Um, that's at least where we started. We have a community of testers and our goal and vision is to make apps better. Better, less bugs and better usable. Right. So, so how do you do that? Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, we don't do it ourselves. Well, we use the concept of crowdsourcing. That means we have a community, global. I think we have more than 150,000 people in 190 something countries in the world. And everyone can sign up on our platform, uh, nest.testperts.com. We ask them uh, requirement or basically their, their profile. So how old are you? What's your income? What do you do uh, for work? But also um, what smartphones do you have? What tablets do you have? And our clients basically ask us that uh, we should make sure that uh, it's bug free, more or less. It's a tough task, but it's almost bug free and has a good usability. So we basically invite people, they test remotely, they give feedback, they find bugs, they get paid for that. They get more money, the more bucks they find. So that's their, their incentive. And that's also the incentive of our clients to find as many bucks as possible. And we analyze everything and cluster that to our clients. How, uh, is, it, is it only mobile phones, tablets, or is it other devices that you test as well? It started five years ago with only websites. Okay, no. like the, the easy stuff. Then it evolved obviously pretty quick to, to mobile uh, no. or smartphones and tablets. Nowadays, we add Internet of Things. You know, we, we tested connected cars, we tested baby phones, we tested vacuum cleaners, we tested toothbrushes, but all of them being connected to an app. So we can, we can test basically connectivity. So with the toothbrush test, for example, was that you had your smartphone, you put it on, on your mirror in, in your bathroom, and then you started brushing your teeth, and it was basically co somehow collecting if you're doing it the right way. So it was connecting. So we basically tested the overall setup the physical device, the old school physical device that is now becoming smarter and connected to, an, uh, to a smartphone or a tablet. But it, it creates an extra difficulty, I suppose, because in, in the past it was just an app that you were testing, but now mm. uh, the, the, there could be a malfunction in the app or in the device itself or somewhere in between. Yes. How, how do you figure that out? Um, we try to provide as, ma as much information as possible. Um, so if there's a crash, we, we try to provide a crash log. Obviously, we're not developers of that particular application, so we just try to help our client with as much information as possible. So that might be, um, so what you get, you get like a step-by-step -step description. You know what happened, what was expected to happen. You have a screenshot, sometimes a video and a crash log. That's what we give to the client and their developers hopefully can, can, can dig into the problem and solve it. Right. But then in, is, is in the crash log, is there, uh, is, there the, uh, is there data also of the toothbrush itself? Or, or that depends on how they developed it. Yeah. We, we don't tell them how to do it. No. Um, but yeah, usually there, there is data in there as well. But also sometimes in very tricky cases, we, they get, our clients get back to us and we ask the tester to do um, like another test or a little bit more digging into details and, and, and try to find what is happening. Is it the device or is it the connectivity or is it the smartphone or is it something else? Yeah. And was it one of or does it happen regularly? Or? Um, I mean, we don't have to go back that often to our, to our testers because usually... Um, no, it's like more than if, if you have uh, the feedback from your customer, it says, okay, uh, I suppose if the toothbrush didn't work for one time, then they say, okay, it's a glitch, uh, but if it happens 10 times or whatever. Yeah, it basically depends also on the occurrence. If it's once off, well, it's once yeah. off, it, yeah. it, whatever happens. Could be anything. Yeah, but if it's always, obviously the severity of a bug is then higher. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, that basically depends. But what makes it actually more complex is Previously, we could just distribute an app over the cloud and then testers could immediately start. Now we have to ship the physical device as well to the testers. So that the whole logistics part gets, makes it a little bit more complex. Very, yeah. And they get the, the toothbrush for free or for a minimum period of time? Or? Yeah, it depends. Um, some products they can actually keep, which is but nice. The, the cars, they have to return. Uh, yeah, the cars, actually, they, <laughs> we look for people with the right car configuration. So we ask for a specific brand, uh, a new model, basically. So we had all those requirements. So the car we couldn't ship, unfortunately. Um, but vacuum cleaners, and they're worth 800 to 1,000 euro each. And we receive 100 of those and basically ship it to our cloud. You need a new office uh, <laughs> we for, for all these. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not actually, it's not a joke. We have a logistic room now uh, as well, where we basically receive all the boxes. We unpack them into smaller pieces and then ship them to the testers. 
and how does it work? Do you also test them yourselves uh, at first, see how they connect or? Um... Yeah, we have a, let's say uh, a quick roundhouse check just to make sure it's, it's actually working. So um, well, how it works basically, we're not only just sending it to testers and tell them, hey, do something. Uh, in the first step, we sit down with the client and we write the test concept and that's what we propose. So to write, to come up with the test concept, our people basically, they look into it and they, they test the app. They yeah. at least have a look that it's at least working and starting. Uh, we've seen apps that actually crash crashed automatically after one minute. So that was not ready to be tested, right? So we told the client, hey, I think we need to do a little bit more work here. And then uh, we, we postponed the launch uh, to start off the test maybe for about two weeks. And now these days, my, my, my cell phone is updating all the apps basically every day. Uh, yeah. um, uh, that's quite hard to test. Yeah, so that's why we have a lot of uh, work to do. Um, also for our clients, it's not that it's a once-off thing. Like once the toothbrush is up and running and we test it once, it's not that that's it and then they're safe because we're all in an HR world. We have updates weekly, daily, whatsoever. So they're frequent tests basically for those products um, alongside because you, you change something, you might, um, yeah, there might be a bug in another area. So you need to make sure that it's really up and running. And we're also in an age where there's a lot of uh, big data, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, before they send out an, uh, an update on their app, do they contact you? And then do they say, okay, maybe we should test it with a few people first, or maybe you have some suggestions of software that can test the app already before we launch it. Yeah, hopefully yes. That's that's the aim of the company, and it really depends. We're not. We don't only want to come in when you're ready and you're just about to launch, right? That is important. That you have. Uh, uh, we call it a bugability test. That's a functional test on bug side and a usability on the usability side, basically, just to show any road blockers, red flags in functionality or usability. But I mean, if we then figure out that actually no one wants to use this app because the use case is completely off, then we should have been testing in the concept phase where you haven't spent any time, any money on basically developing the app. So where we want to basically come in with our clients very early, you have a concept, you have an idea. Before actually starting with anything, ask someone. That's what everyone's telling you, get user feedback. And we can accommodate that as well. But it's very difficult. But usually these companies are not structured like that. They have an idea and they do a lot of brainstorms and brown paper session and everything. And then they, they have a lot of money yeah. spent on research and everything. Yeah. And they spend a lot of money on, on, on developing the app. And then they uh, um, maybe they test it a little bit, but then they launch it and then they get the feedback. Yeah. So how, how do you educate your customers? How do you get, because it's, it's already difficult to get customers, I suppose. I mean, it's not easy yeah. to get these corporates to do business with you, yeah. but how do you educate them? I think it's driven by cases. We can basically show what we've been doing with other customers before. And to be honest, those companies are changing. It takes them to change. It takes time to change from like this old waterfall model, as you described, we go research, we spend millions here, and then we develop, and then hopefully someone is like, is like, likes what we're doing two years later. The world is changing. Everyone's talking about, we need to move faster. We need to have scrum teams. We need to be HR and all of the, those things. Rapid prototyping is another buzzword. Um, so also the big corporates are changing. It just takes them a little longer than the smaller, the small and medium companies, but they are changing. And I think we can help them to show them, hey, this is, you don't have to invest a million to work with us, right? You can start really, really small, real quick. And if you want actually like tomorrow or next week, that's the speed that we can bring basically into this partnership. And once they've done it once with us, they see, they've suddenly then realized, okay, I can use it here and there and there maybe. And then the partnership grows. Does it also include um, already incorporating uh, your advice or, or people that are testers with you um, before they, uh, like in the development of the app? Yeah. So it's basically go through several stages. So one is the concept where you have just an idea, then you have a mock-up or prototype, which might be ju just some scrabbles that we can, again, validate against your target audience. Um, then it goes in development where in a sprint, we can test the sprint result, for example, also over the weekend and so on. So there are several tools that we can use um, to support our clients. And usually you have a project manager from our side as well on board. And this person is basically consulting you. When does it make sense to use which kind of service? How should the test concept look like? How many tests do we need? How should we ask the question? How do we analyze it? And, and then finally also giving them recommendations. Is, is it also working the other way around? Is it, do you get a feedback or suggestions from, from, from your test group that said, okay, it would be great if the app had this feature, but I, I can't find it. So yeah. it's, a it's one of the most common question. I think we excluded almost every time is if you would be in charge of that product, what would you change? 
Yeah? Or what would you keep? That's also, by the way, a very powerful question. Not only ask what needs to be uh, improved, but also keep that what is really good. That's the core. Yeah. yeah. And that's, uh, that's one of the questions in any kind of usability study we usually add because that gives really, really power um, to, the, to the results. Now, you have a lot of testers, 150,000 in yeah. uh, many, many countries. How, how do you uh, manage all the data coming from there? I mean, it's, uh, we have a community team, or we call it a crowd management team. Um, it's four people um, in our Munich uh, headquarters, and they are basically in charge for uh, recruiting and entertaining those people. So they recruit them based on what we see from our clients, where, uh, where is demand. We have a higher demand nowadays from Africa, for example. Uh, two years ago, no one asked uh, for, for testers there, but as we're now growing global with our client base and they're also doing apps in Africa, so we, we're moving the focus on several regions and countries, several target audiences. I mean, IT students, we have enough in our system, but we want to have, because we're working for- Housewives. Housewives, for example, and uh, I always refer to my mother. She also is part of our community because she gives value, valuable feedback for apps that she's using, actually. And if I would give that feedback to an app that she's using, that would be completely different, but I'm not the target audience because I'm not using it. So you, you should ask, for example, my, mo my mom to well, do so. You already knew your mom. How do you get to all the other mothers? That's, that's the tricky part, and that's basically what that team is, is all about to do. Um, so it goes, you can go social media, obviously. You can go blogs, obviously. But will you find my mom there? Not sure. So you even have to go offline sometimes. Yeah, to promote so basically. You have all these testers and they provide you with a lot of intel. There mm -hmm. must be tons of data coming in, uh, all these test results and test reports from people. How do you make a report out of that to your customer? So um, it's not that we have like 1,000 people testing one website or one application. Um, it's more or less between 20 and 50 on, uh, on average. So it's qualitative feedback. We're not only doing a star rating, yeah, like this four stars and that's it, and then you have an average and then you have your distribution. It's more actually, what we try to answer is the why question. Why did you give four stars? Why did you give only two stars? What needs to happen in order to improve that? So it's a qualitative analysis, um, which is pre-analyzed by the system. And then you'll need people, basically, you need UX experts. And that's the, these are the people that we have on the team. What gets really complex, actually, is to find the people for each project. So let's say we only need 30 people, but we have 150,000. So how do you find the right 30 people? So what happens basically in our system, we set constraints. So we tell the system, we, na we need males and females, that age group in that country with those hobbies and other 60 criteria that you can filter, having an iPhone 7 with iOS 10 or an Android whatsoever. Okay, and that's what we can, basically we can click that together. And then the system basically looks how many people we have, let's say a thousand, but it still doesn't invite 1000 because if I invite 1000 and only 30 get a spot, the 900, uh, 70 are upset. So we basically have an algorithm that makes sure that we fill up the spaces or the slots that we have on time before the test start. That's, a, that's let's say, a little bit more complicated on the algorithm side. Well, that sounds good. Um, yeah. Obviously, I tried to, uh, to enroll in the, in the program as well. And uh, yeah. I'm just wondering who is doing the, the, the design and the testing of the, uh, uh, the web page on my uh, uh, Samsung Galaxy uh, uh, S7 Edge? Yeah. Because I had some difficulties there. You had some difficulties, yeah. so that's valuable feedback then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's also, I mean, as I said, bug free doesn't no. exist. Um, not for us, not for anyone no. in the world. Um, so if you found a bug, um, I think that makes you a really good tester in our crowd. So I invite you to sign up sure. uh, on our no, website. We're basically signing up, but uh, uh, do, you, do you test your own website and application as well? It's like yes. uh, eat your own dog food. Actually, with yeah. We, True, it is awkward. It's um, we have a crowd. We have several crowd tests on not only the website but also on our Nest. That's the, the platform. Um, but the second part we haven't discussed it yet really is what we also added uh, beginning of the year. It's also in testing really biggest test automation, right? You have manual testers to to cover like everything which you cannot automate, but you have also test automation. So we're also running test automation on our on our platform, on our uh, website, and our Nest. And that's actually the second part of the business that we're doing. And that script that are uh, and that you use pre-filled uh, uh, yeah. data to to yeah. go to a web form or anything. Yeah. Um, it's scripted data, and what we provide here is not only scripting that data because we have experts in the crowd and they can script those scripts, but we also have the environments in the cloud. So we have actually two components, and the cloud uh, gives you basically any virtual machine or emulated device for smartphone and tablets. I've heard it before, but does it really work? I mean, can you really emulate all these uh, varieties in the cloud? 
Uh, it's quite good. It's an emulator, so we all know the, the downsides. You don't have the pro uh, you don't have all the sensors, for example, in an emulated device, right? But at least you can see the the screen issue that you just recommended or that you just mentioned on a Samsung something that you would would have um, been observing there as well. So there isn't a truth between it's only automation or only crowd testing or only internal. It's a mixture of all of that. Now. I recently saw a brilliant um, uh, uh, video for the introduction of a new software from Viv Labs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard about it. They talk about, um, I think they used to be the developers of Siri uh, and mm -hmm. now they moved on and they've just been sold to Samsung actually. And um, they have what they call uh, conversational commerce. And mm -hmm. So they say things is, are going to be voice based, yeah. um, but uh, if they're voice based, uh, nobody is going to, not every app developer is going to develop its own. Uh, voice interface. Yeah. So what you need is, is one voice interface that controls all the apps. Yeah. So they did great, great demos you, using data that's on your phone and knowledge they had about you and using various apps yeah. uh, and you saw a script just basically real-time written on the screen as it happens. So how would that involve your business? Because that would make a lot of apps or the experience in the apps more or less obsolete. Um, more or less true. Um, actually, it is also a big topic with um, a test birds, voice testing. Um, the key challenge right now is really understanding and really under not only transcribing, but understanding what the tester wants. And it doesn't matter which technology you look at, if it's Siri, if it's Google, we're not there yet. So we'll still need a lot of input, basically, that those intelligent machines become smarter and learn basically any kind of accent, any kind of language and so on. So. I see the same thing. It will be more voice driven. We had also, um, at least in Germany, this Amazon something box being launched that I can place anywhere. And in it Alexa, also, I think, uh, yeah. yeah, and it, it listens basically and, yeah. and does, uh, does things for me. Um, I heard and I tried, for example, with my Siri, it is still quite limited what I can do with her. She, I think 50% of my queries end up, sorry, I, can't, I didn't understand you. I look in the web for you. Yeah. And then, yeah, thanks. That's not then what I, you want to hear. No, and yeah. then I go on my, and then I still have to do manually. Yeah. yeah. So, but yes. it's a phase, obviously, because you see it improving uh, uh, yes. year on year. And I see I, this will improve, definitely. Um, it might take a year or two or five, we don't know, but this will improve. But still, you, you still have this usability um, component to it, right? So it's not only if I touch it, and then I control it with my voice, but still is it the, the, I still have a process. I still have a user flow basically through that the, the app or the voice will lead me. And that's the, actually the same, the same questions so is, is the checkout, pro like how will I shop on Amazon? Will I just tell my, Hey phone, please get me whatever. And then how will that phone respond? Will it ask me, how many questions will it ask me? What's the quantity? Is the price okay? Should I get the cheapest one? When do you need to look? Like there are many, many questions throughout the checkout process that no one actually knows what we want. So basically you're going to test dialogues because that is what it, yeah. what it is. More yeah. or less. It, now it's also dialogue. It's just right. touch it's, based it's and then it's voice-based voice, yeah. voice -based voice dialogue. dialogue. Right. Interesting. Is, is there any other new technology that you see happening that could impact your business or that you'd like to, to involve in your business? Um, Yes, and that's what I, what I briefly mentioned with test automation. Um, so when the so company is five years old now, and we started purely with crowd, and uh, we always were driven by customer feedback, actually. So when we started, we had one simple test, which was find bugs, that's it, right? Simple. We had no final report, we had no usability feedback. All of that basically evolved because client asked, like, hey, can you give us usability feedback as well? We said, sure, here's a new service called usability testing. And so the, the company evolved. Um, so one input is client-based, the other is market-driven, technology-driven. So what is a big thing is test automation. Um, the market uh, out there basically tells that test automation is driving the testing space. That is the key grow, uh, yeah, growth driver, actually. Um, the second one is crowd, and the third is actually declining or is being stable is internal testing. Um, we are we're really good in crowd. Um, and we, funnily, we had three years ago, another cu customer asked us, hey guys, can you, we have an ID verification tool, but it highly depends on the operating system and the browser. We have 1000 combinations. Can you test that for us? And if you're young in a startup, you say, yes, we can, because you always say yes when a client asks you something. So we said, yes, we can do that. Then we, because we thought, yeah, we have 20,000 testers back then, we might find 1000 with different combinations. Truth is, we didn't because everyone's updating the, to the latest Chrome, to the latest Windows, to the latest Mac. So you always have the latest versions and maybe maybe a few older, but not the really old ones. No. 
And we're so, using Mosaic anymore. Yeah, not really. <laughs> Then we thought, okay, let's build a flexible system because we, we are IT people, we can do that. We just build a flexible system that builds all those systems together. And that is Task Chameleon nowadays, which is um, what I mentioned, a virtual machine generator, an emulated device generator in the cloud. And we started three years ago, and that is basically supporting and helping our clients running test automation. Um, and then we basically later, we figured out internally this time that when we combine those two worlds, we have... 150,000 testers. We have millions of combinations in the cloud. If we combine those two products, because they used to be separate, we can even we ha even have leverage effects. So what we can do, for example, we can ask a tester to write the test automation script that the client will then execute in the cloud. Or last example, um, you have the Samsung issue, right? You reported to me as as uh, test birds, but my designer he doesn't have your phone. So he wants to reproduce that, that issue, but he can't because the phone is not in our office. So there are a few options what he can do. Um, and the best option is he just clicks on your report because we know what device you reported on. He clicks on a button and we launch him that device in the cloud and he can retest your issue there. Right. So we're giving basically supporting tools to yeah. our clients. And how does it work out? How, how much time does it cost if there's a, is a new device coming out uh, to, to put it as a new Xiaomi uh, coming out? I, I think I saw it this morning. How, yeah. how much time does it take you to put it in, in, the, in the emulator? It depends on how quickly there is an emulator available and then we have to customize it uh, slightly. So it's basically in our backlog and as soon as we see them, we prioritize which ones we add to the emulator. Right. To the yeah. emulators. Because, uh, who, who provides the emulator? You don't build it yourself, but it is uh, somebody else doing yeah. that. Yeah, so on iOS we use the, uh, the iOS emulator on Android, to be honest, I don't know, but there might be an Android emulator. So what There must be a lot of Android emulators. Yeah, so I, I, I can't tell you what mm. technology is behind that, but I just know that we need to touch it and change it slightly and then include it. Um, since, since you're a global company, you mm. must uh, also see uh, or, or encounter certain differences in cultures and everything, because if you have one app from a global uh, yeah. uh, customer that is testing it out in, in various countries, uh, yeah. you get various kinds of feedback. You do. You do. Can you, you have do. some examples on that? Yes. Um, a voice test just recently, because we were talking yeah. about voices. Um, we had a test somewhere in Asia and somewhere in Europe. Uh, I don't know which country it was. Uh, it doesn't matter. Like an Asian country and the European country. And the way basically people start voice commands is completely different in those cultures. You know, someone says, I want like to do A, B and C yeah? and others are more direct and say, do A, B and C, right? That's completely different, but it freaks out the, the system. Uh, I can't tell you who's the, who's the client, but this is completely different on the way we, we work and we, we, use, we use voice command. And that's the same actually, if you, we had an app being tested in China and in Germany with the same UI that mostly doesn't really work, no. right? The Chinese expect something different than we in Germany, for example. Right. Um, so yes, that is a, co a core thing is localization. And it's not only translation, but also localized usability. Localized UI um, is, a, is a really big topic. Are the customers that were surprised by the, by the feedback that never thought about that is happening, that are making various versions now on the yeah. UA on, of the interface? It depends. Uh, some are surprised, some knew it, and they just want us to prove it because they need it internally. That's also sometimes the case. Right. Um, yeah. Maybe another really interesting to make it even more complex is a VoIP um, provider, uh, voice over IP uh, phone calling. And what they, wanna, what they ask us to do is make sure that the connectivity from 53 countries to the other 53 countries are, are working. So we, call, we have 53 testers calling each other bi-weekly to make sure that it's up and running. That's an interesting test. It's, yeah. it's, it's a different kind of test. but It's, it's different kind of test, but it's kind of... Comp How would you do that if you wouldn't have a crowd? Right. You can hire... You need 53 offices or something, right? And that is like from whole management and organization, this is kind of a nightmare. For us, it's like, okay, we set the requirements on the system. People get invited. Still, this is quite a lot of work from our side as well, but it's still fa it's very fast. We recently uh, talked to, uh, to a company called uh, Brain Engineers, and uh, mm -hmm. they do uh, some sort of usability testing uh, or, um, or lab testing, but they use um, a device that can measure your brain activity. So they okay. can uh, find out uh, whether you're frustrated or uh, yeah. uh, what your intentions are. Yeah. Is, is it something that you, you would consider to add as well? Yeah, as, a, as an option, as an add-on, definitely. Um, we're, we're basically not um, set with the tools that we use. We, we try to be as flexible as possible because we have clients using tool A, B, and C, others using another tool. 
um, for we've never used something that is trying to read uh, your emotions yet, uh, but that's something really interesting and really important as well, I think. So I'm actually interested to, to maybe just give it a try with one of our clients. Um, as I can give you another example, which is like heat mapping um, thing. We, a client asks us if we can include a, a heat map tool, basically that they have nice right. areas where people clicked and, and looked at. Uh, we also did that. And we just collected that data as well, looked at the data and combined it with the, the written feedback, the written qualitative feedback. Uh, so if you have another part which reads your emotions and your brain activity, that could be really interesting. You're located, uh, your, your, your company is located in Germany. You have, uh, Offices in three, four countries yeah. outside of that, uh, uh, and also businesses in other countries. How? Uh, what, what is your growth path? Where, where are you going? Yeah, so true. We we start in Munich, where the headquarters. Uh, we have an office uh, here in Amsterdam with a team. We have one in London. We're building one in Stockholm. Uh, we have a franchise partner in Eastern Europe, in Hungary, uh, another one in uh, Russia, Moscow, and one in Italy. So it is European based plus Moscow at this point in time. Um, our goal is basically to expand and to be local, be local to our clients because we're in a B2B and I strongly believe you need to be local to really sell and to deliver high quality and have a good client relationship. The community of testers is global. So as I mentioned, 53 countries, that is a global test that is running. Um, so the requests for testing are global. Our offices are local in Europe as of now. Clients still, we have cli we have tons of clients in the US as well because we meet them at the show where we, we get inbound through the website. So we support them as well. Uh, but yet we don't have uh, an office over there. Yet? Yet. Next year? Uh, that's actually, we only plan towards the end of this year because this was a really challenging and interesting year. What happens next year is really, I don't know, to be honest. No. This is something uh, that, I, that we will have planned with the team uh, by the end of the year. Yeah, but it's obviously an option. Right. So, so how, how are, because it's, there's a lot of a debate, or there has been a lot of debate about uh, whether startups could, could uh, emerge from Europe and whether they could be successful without going to, uh, mm. to Silicon Valley and everything. So, and, and I don't think that uh, um, in Germany, there, there must be a lot of people that are still a little bit conservative when you start a startup company instead of working for a corporate company. So how did that go in your, uh, in your life? Yeah. What did your mother say when you said, uh, mom, I'm not going to work for a consultancy company. I'm going to start yeah. my startup. Yeah, yeah. Very good question. Um, first of all, I had, I had support from mom and dad, basically, because they knew I'm not going to work for a consulting company. Although my CV looks like uh, made for being hired by one of the consulting firms. Um, but the reason is personal, that is basically what, what drives me. And um, I realized that corporate world doesn't drive me if I'm part of that. Like working in that big organization, it's just not, it's just not what I want. It's just not what, what makes me happy. I tried six, seven internships, global, big companies, all different names. Um, and I realized actually that's not what I want to do. Um, I had a, a small company, which was a, a project in school which became um, the best company in that project for um, Baden-Württemberg, which is stayed in Germany. And there I, I was running the company with uh, 10 friends or so, uh, also crowdsourcing, I IT support. So I realized that is that actually, that, that's good. That for that, I could get up in the morning and I have fun doing that. So um, during university, I basically thought about how can I start a company? But just willing to start is not enough because you need the idea. So we tried to force an idea. Um, so with a few friends from university then, uh, one is now also co-founder of TestBirds, and we brainstormed several ideas. We looked into, for example, mobile payment. We spent a lot of time on mobile payment, realizing, you know, you're just one small chain there, and there's like a lot of other stakeholders around that. And if one falls apart, then your, your, your business model is gone. So you have too much... Uh, reliance on others um, yeah and later we came up with crowdsourcing and testing um, it took us a week to think about that to do like the primary primarily uh, market research and then we said let's give it a go let's do it was, was, how did you come with uh, come up with the idea was a personal frustration or uh, um, several things so we looked into crowdsourcing before um, because this was a trend is still a trend so we looked into crowdsourcing I, I had some experience with that as well Marcus the, the other the third founder as well um, and then Georg and myself, we're both, we used to be developers, uh, not the best, but we know how to code. Um, and it used to be, you don't code anymore. You I don't, don't do it. You don't touch it. None of us do it anymore. And that's good. Um, 
So yeah, we realized that, okay, if we look in, let's look into IT. What's frustrating in IT? Testing. No one tests, no one wants to test. And if you have a plan for testing, usually that's eaten up by the delay of development. So hey, let's look something into testing. There was crowd on another piece of paper and then we combined it. And then we thought, this makes so much sense. Let's give it a try. And then you told your mom and dad they were uh, supporting you, but then you told your friends and, uh, and relatives and friends that, uh, from school or colleagues, whatever, and, uh, and they I said had, you're crazy. No, no one actually. No? No, actually no, one's, no one ever told me I'm, I, I shouldn't do that. I, should, I, I'm not, I don't know why. I think people realized throughout the time from this first company in school, and I was a, a freelance developer myself as well, so that's how I financed university in school. Um, I think they, everyone in my friends basically realized I'm not going to work for a corporate. Um, and because you asked me, I think that has changed now as well. It's not that conservative anymore. It still is, but um, back five years ago it was good. It's even better now. We have so many startups and all the media around all the startups and how successful and how important it is um, has changed. Although I, I know if I talk privately with a few friends that they also, yeah, I would like to start something, but I don't want to take the risk. And I mean, that's fine. That's totally fine. Then, then just go that way that works for you best. For me, my, my estimation is always get up in the morning. Do you want to, do you, are you looking forward to go to work? Then you're doing the right thing. If you're not, then something needs to change. Obviously, that's not all, every day the, day, uh, the, the, the case, but on average, it should be the one that you go for work and you have fun. If not, you need but to change. But then you become the CEO of a company and there are certain things that you uh, probably do not like that much. For instance, how did, I, I just presume that it was a difficult thing, but all of a sudden you, you, you notice you're, you have a company, you want to grow and you need money. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you have to have a different conversation with different people about different topics and you probably did not want to talk about that every day. How, how did that go? How did your financing go? Um, good actually and lucky as well. That's also something that you need to be uh, in order to survive like more than five years now. Um, we had support from the government. So we have, we have a system in Germany that is like a scholarship for up to three founders for up to a year. Uh, nowadays you get two and a half thousand euro per month as a scholarship paid by the university if you get accepted. So you have to apply for it if you get accepted. Three people, one year, year nowadays two and a half thousand. Back then it was two thousand. For me it was eight hundred because I was still writing my master thesis. Um, and then you get like twenty something thousand for for whatever hardware that you need. So it's a, it helps you to basically start with your idea for a year. And this is really good. This is actually amazing that we have something like this. Sounds very good, yes. And this, it helps because it takes off the risk, basically the financial risk for a year. You will not get rich during that time, but at least you can, you you can, pay, pay, rent you can pay your rent, your food, and that's it. That's all you need because you work anyways 24-7 almost. Um, and um, yeah, then we also had a network in, in Munich, uh, which is now called Buy Startup, and they, they have like a business angel network. Uh, so we, for some reasons, we met them, we were in contact, they were helping us a little bit with our one patron. That's the thing you need when you, when you talk to investors. Then we went up to a business angel get together ring and they told, yeah, there will be 10 people. And actually two showed up. You know, you think there are 10 business angels and suddenly there are only two. So your chances are now down by 20% that you win. So we still did the pitch like five minutes or so. And the guy really liked what we're doing. And he basically told me, come to my office next week. We'll do the investment that you look um, on our own. We don't need anyone else. And that was just a, two months after we, or one month after we got the scholarship. So basically suddenly there was a lot of money potentially there. And then we we're thinking, do we need the money? What should we do with the money? So then you, you start, you have new thoughts. You start thinking, okay, now I have a, mark, I have a proven market. I have a few clients. I, I might get money, I can grow. So what can we do there? So it's actually taking step by step. And more or less reversed. I mean, yeah, you didn't have the growth plans. You had uh, the money first, and then all of a sudden you had to think about yeah. how, how are we going to spend you, that in a, in, a, in, a, in a valuable way. In, in the good. beginning, it's all about selling. You need the market proof, right? You can have the best product, no sell, you, worth, you, you, you have no value, right? You need to prove your product on the market, at the market as quickly as you can. We had our first client. So we started in October, with, end of October, with the first idea. Our first client we had by Christmas. That's fast. Yeah, because we just we were sitting like this and we were pitching to someone and we yeah a little bit bold story. We told them yeah we have twenty five uh, clients and we have a few hundred testers and so on. You, what you need to do is sometimes, um, and then they said okay sounds good. Let's do it next week. We have had nothing. 
we haven't had any testers, we haven't had any system, we seriously, we had nothing. Um, so yeah, all our friends from university, they received an email and we told them, hey guys, you need to test and please send me an email if you find the bug and send me a screenshot. It's a nightmare to manage that. If yeah. your inbox goes in with bugs and nothing has a, has a written format and, and everything. But we learned basically while delivering how our service needs to look like. And that is one key of our success so far. And then one customer turned into the other and one financing round turned into the, to the other. Yeah, yeah, you do. I mean, the financing is then a story. OK, we want to expand. We not only want to play it, uh, Germany, we want to expand in Europe. We want to um, invest also in technology, like the test automation part then started back then as well. Uh, but for me personally, my role completely changed over time, multi many, many times. Um, I've been doing something different last year, the year before and that year before. I used to be the developer, so I built the first platform. Um, then we hired uh, Daniel, uh, our first developer, and I think it took him half a year or a year to tell me that I should stop developing. So I, I actually then stopped developing for good reasons, and I don't develop anymore. And now Georg is basically running uh, that technology team and the development team, and I'm, I'm completely out of, of that area although I was starting it back then. So your role now, sometimes shifts. you're surprised by what you see and, uh, and what they have made. You, you receive the bi-weekly release notes and you say, nice, nice. And I don't have to do any, like this is out of magic. control. This is, yeah, magic. This is how team works, works then. And I think you're pretty uh, um, focused on team. You have uh, quite mm -hmm. some ideas on how, how to do that. You have like a regular one-on-ones and, uh, and things mm -hmm. like that. Did you, did you develop some sort of a own methodology in that or ideas about that? Um, you improve over time. Obviously, no one's perfect, and you tr you you start. I basically just start trying what I think is is good, and then I, I try, and then I ask for feedback, and then I see how I can improve. Then obviously, you also read by people who have a clue what they are doing. Um, and yeah, I figured out that one on ones is actually one of the most important thing as a manager. Although well, I don't like to be called like that, but as if you're if you're leading t uh, people, then I think one on one is the most powerful institution that that you have and you should meet with everyone on your team that is directly in your team from my point of view weekly or bi-weekly at least 30 minutes and let them set the agenda it's not a reporting meeting like i have a lot of sales people and in the beginning they start okay here philip that's my pipeline i will win this deal here 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 blah 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 and i told them i can see that it's in the system let, let's talk about topics that's really important to move you forward like stuff what do you need from me that you can make your work even better yeah. And how is the team right now? Is there anything that we need to know what, that we should discuss? Um, so that's how I try to, to lead um, or run through my one-on-ones. It sounds also like a, a, an approach that you hear about it that is needed for, for well, uh, hiring millennials and, and people like that, not, not, uh, more purpose-driven, uh, uh, more interested in yeah. what, what they want, etc. Is, is it hard to get new people? Yes, that's hard. That's maybe even the hardest part of the business to hire good, smart people um, who are basically, yeah, living the same culture and running on their own and getting and asking for feedback when they need to. But they're basically interested and in running. You mentioned the purpose, basically understanding the, the company's purpose and basically aiming for that. Um, it's hard. It's hard to find good talent. Yeah. So how do you do that? Uh, recruiting it's yeah it, it's various things uh, in some countries we we've used headhunters um, we uh, have a lot of job adverts uh, we start now to invest more and more in employer branding as well be more on recruitment trade show, uh, shows next year um, yeah and just try to be a little bit different on also the way we we uh, you see on our website you see the, the career part we are actually a really nice team and uh, the, the hard part is there are other companies who are also really nice and good. So you are competing against all the other amazing companies. So it's hard, it's, but it's part of the business. I mean, you just have to do it and be a little bit better, hopefully. Well, that sounds like good closing word. Be a little bit better and be, be nice. Thank yeah. you for, uh, for being here with us. This was uh, another episode of, uh, of Nerd Talk. I hope you enjoyed uh, talking and I promise to be back a little bit faster than the previous uh, time. Um, so uh, I hope to see you soon.